It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephanie Hare. Dr. Stephanie Hare is a historian, technologist, and political risk analyst whose work examines one of the most vexing problems facing cities today and in the future, which is how can we create, use, and govern technologies in ways that support human and planetary flourishing? How can we make sure that technology does not undermine human rights, erode democracy, and drive climate catastrophe? These are enormously complex questions, and Dr. Hare is uniquely positioned to tackle them. In her public scholarship, she brings a historian's attention to context and detail, a technologist's ability to open the black box of the algorithm, and a keen journalistic ability to shine a bright light on all the ways in which technologies are not neutral. Dr. Hare is a frequent commentator on the BBC and regularly published in the Financial Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, and more. Her forthcoming book, Technology Ethics, analyzes biometrics, big data, data protection, and children's data. If you care about issues of ethics and technology, you are in the right place and you should follow Stephanie on Twitter. It is my pleasure to invite Dr. Hare to share her thoughts with us today on urban futures and smart green cities. Welcome, Dr. Hare. Thank you very much uh, for that wonderful and generous introduction. Uh, without further ado, we're going to jump in. My topic today is looking at smart cities, the opportunities and risks of the technology that can make our cities run more efficiently, but challenge some of the rights that we have come to enjoy and indeed celebrate, and some other problems that are introduced by these technologies as well. So without further ado, this is the structure of the talk. Goal is divided into three parts, Caesar said, and so is this talk. So the first part is looking at the challenge of smart city technology, the trends of how humans are increasingly moving into cities and will be dominant there by the end of the century, the opportunities of smart city technology and the risks. The second part looks at the technology specifically, and I highlight some of the biggest hits such as artificial intelligence, biometrics, um, an example of biometrics, which is facial recognition, the Internet of Things, and 5G telecommunications infrastructure. And then the last part is looking at who is building your smart city technology, which is a key and indeed foundational concern if you are looking to improve your city using this tech. So without further ado, a very quick introduction to me, since I cannot be with you in person. You'd like to at least see the face uh, mixed with the voice and who this person claims to be she is. So subjects, my expertise in research, it focuses on the intersection of technology, politics, and history. And I've got a book coming out later this year on technology ethics, which includes some of the insights that are in this presentation. So I've been working as an independent researcher and broadcaster since 2018, but before that I worked at Accenture, Palantir, I was a fellow at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, and a political risk analyst for many years at Oxford Analytica, um, and then had a couple of years doing coding um, at Accenture early in my career. But I've largely trained as an academic in terms of my educational uh, formation. And then languages, I wanted to include the human languages and the computer languages, because one of the themes that's in my research and indeed in this presentation is that this technology is something that all of us as humans are capable of understanding and doing, and indeed we're already doing it possibly without even being aware of it. So no need for um, anyone to feel intimidated. It's like, super accessible. And I've written this PowerPoint deck in a way that all of the resources and references are there, sh should you wish to dig deeper, um, all using open source. So the challenge that we will be discussing in this presentation is this. The situation is that smart cities use technologies that deliver greener energy and improve traffic flow, both of cars on the road, but also public transport. And in theory, possibly even better governance, strengthening the relationship between citizens and the state. The complication is that these very same technologies also introduce greater surveillance, um, more of a threat to our civil liberties and higher cybersecurity risks. Those are not to be taken lightly. So the question 
the challenge is how can we balance smart technologies so that they improve our lives rather than diminish and harm them? What does good look like when it comes to smart cities and how do we measure it? So what metrics do we need to come up with so that we can check ourselves to know if we're going in the right direction or the wrong direction? So the trend for humans this century is this, we are urbanizing. 55% uh, of us on earth already live in cities and that trend is going to be up to 70% by 2050. Pretty close to um, most of us will be living in cities by the end of this century, unless of course there's some sort of intervention, but that's the trend at the moment. And so this introduces a lot of problems to either solve or mitigate not sure if you can solve climate change, but there's definitely things we can do to mitigate some of the risks associated with it. So um, I am speaking to you today from London where the biggest natural disasters we have are rain <laughs> and bad weather, but a lot of cities around the world have to contend with things that are far more serious like heat waves and indeed wildfires that we have seen, floods, droughts, earthquakes, tornadoes and hurricanes. And of course, a lot of cities and indeed countries have set themselves targets, climate targets, to be either carbon neutral, to be net zero, or indeed carbon negative. Now, carbon negative is sort of the halcyon dream, but some companies have gone for it, uh, largely the big tech companies. So it's just worth being aware of that, that context is happening. There's also the public health dimension with smart cities and humans living in cities more, which is that we're already having to monitor pollution of our air, water, and soil, but we are talking in the middle of a pandemic that's been going on for a little over a year now. There's an argument that we could use smart city technology to help us do things like pandemic surveillance risk, indeed to be part of our preparedness in case it happens again, and our response if we're not able to stop it in time. So linking up data and using it in ways that improve public health would be the dream. Um, urban planning. This is a really important point on the concepts of accessibility and inclusivity. So cities have to work for everyone, not just the able-bodied and the single. They need to work for children. They need to work for parents of young children. They need to work for the elderly. They need to work for wheelchair users, people who are blind or deaf or have other impairments. Um, so we need to think about that. And we also need to think about cities as assets, what assets we have there. And trees are a big part of that. Um, trees are part of helping to deal with pollution in terms of absorbing carbon dioxide but also in terms of keeping our cities cooler and being actually part of our, our response to the climate change problem. Um, they are worth millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, the assets of trees in our cities. So how do we manage that and steward that and what role can we use with smart city technology to do that? Crime, wherever there are people, <laughs> there's crime. There's a couple of different technologies that we'll be talking about later in this presentation, including facial recognition and predictive policing. So I'm just going to sort of flag that there. We'll go into the detail later. And then finally, jobs. So the question just here regarding jobs is whether or not smart cities offer employment opportunities or will that be taking people's jobs? Will it be another example of the hybrid nature of human technology pairings? and how, how is that going to work? And therefore, how do we skill and educate our workforce to be able to take advantage of these technologies and use them for good? So without further ado, jumping into smart cities opportunities. You link up your hospitals, your ambulances, your police, et cetera. And again, pandemic pre preparedness and response. That's gonna be a massive factor as we think that through. And then I put in also supply chain. <laughs> for both the public sector and the private sector. Because again, um, supply chain sounds really boring, but I'm actually passionate about it. I think it's fascinating. We're gonna go into it a little bit here. As you build out your smart city, you will have to think about everything from literally the ground in which you are extracting minerals that you need to make batteries, for instance, semiconductor chips, things that most of us are not aware of, we're just using these things, but they are absolutely fundamental to it. And a few countries around the world dominate that very small section of an entire chain that leads into your devices, sensors around our city, the 5G infrastructure network that we're looking to build for telecommunications. It's a massive complicated nest of questions. 
So thinking about who controls your supply chain so that you have national sovereignty, you have security of energy supply, um, you have security of your data and your citizens' data, those will be massive. Third category of resilience. So we're quite reactive, I think, at the moment. Um, we've certainly been caught on the back foot the past year or two with this pandemic, and that's invited a lot of us to think about how do we improve our resilience? How do we get more strategic? What needs to change? How can we learn from this to make life better? So one concept is called digital twins, which is where you will be gathering up as much data as you already have about your city from open data sets, um, sensors that you might have, social media activity, et cetera, and bring it all together into a system that you can use to get almost a virtual mirror of what your city looks like. Now it's never going to be perfect because there's all sorts of human interactions that are not captured digitally and never can be, but it's better than nothing, maybe. <laughs> That's the hypothesis anyways. And you can use it to test different scenarios, right? So you can practice different changes that you might want to do, different adaptations and see what effects they have. So it's a very interesting concept. It could be useful in things like disaster planning. Um, here in the UK, where I am in London, the biggest disaster, as we all know, is the weather followed by the food. But um, I say that with all love, I love it here. But that said, there are cities around the world that have to deal with earthquakes, tornadoes, fires, hurricanes, etc. So working your disaster planning into your resilience and of course, public health surveillance um, will be huge. Public health being the fourth category, it's not just about the pandemic. It's also about things that pre-existed the virus that has dominated our minds for so long. And that's things like monitoring pollution, the effects on health that we can see. So, you know, risks of asthma, um, we can do it to better study schools and the environment around schools where children's bodies are forming, um, near hospitals, etc. So it also gives that transparency to the public so that they understand when certain policies, for instance, taxes are being introduced, that there's a health impact and how to show the, the benefit, the cost benefit analysis, which brings me to my final point, which is on democracy. Um, there's an amazing opportunity with smart cities to strengthen democracy in the relationship between citizens and those who govern in our name. So for many of us, our biggest concern in life is what's actually happening locally, particularly in a city. So when I go around and chat to my neighbors, what they want to know is when is the rubbish being collected? Why is it only being collected once a week when in other places it's collected twice? Um, and that links to tax policy. It might be the, you know, the city hasn't fixed a broken street light and that's really dangerous for the women walking home at night um, and, in, and also the men. Um, it might be about a traffic area, a high traffic area near a school and parents are concerned and how quickly you can get a response on that. And we've already discussed reporting <laughs> tree health. So those things can be really important. And I wanted to highlight an example here in the UK, which is my society. They have something called fixmystreet.com which is a really fun way of reporting local issues very quickly to your local authority. And also they work for us.co.uk, which is all about linking via your postcode to your member, uh, member of parliament, your representative. So it's e making it easy for you to talk to your local officials about problems on the ground. Now, the last point I've got here in this democracy section is who benefits profits from citizens data. And I think that's the, that's the tricky bit about smart cities is, you know, Google, the American company that's got a market capitalization of over a trillion dollars is very big on smart cities and its track record has been quite problematic. And one of the big concerns is, do we want an entire city, for instance, Toronto, where it rolled out its sidewalk labs, to be creating data that goes to profit this Silicon Valley company? How do you make it so that the data value goes to the citizens. So that's an existential threat. <laughs> um, smart cities risks. We've got privacy and civil liberties, cybersecurity, and then amplifying existing problems. So it kind of goes without saying that if you're going to put cameras and sensors all over your city, you're going to have a privacy problem. Some people are fine with that. Other people are not. So that's something that we need to debate as a democracy rather than just rolling it out and kind of checking it later. 
So surveillance 24-7, um, we're talking CCTV. Uh, I live in the, one of the cities, I think that's got the most cameras in the world per person. So what does that feel like? Uh, facial recognition technology, which is very different than CCTV. Those cameras that watch me as I walk all over London don't know who I am and it would be very hard for them to find that. Someone would have to take the footage and deliberately run it through software. Whereas if there was facial recognition capability on the cameras, they would be able to track me in real time as I'm walking down the street and figure out that I'm Stephanie here. And then triangulate that with my phone and all sorts of other things about me. So it's very powerful. It also links to this question of um, predictive policing. And that I had mentioned a little bit before, which is about using data sets in order to, in theory, better use policing resources. So it sounds great, but there are problems with that that we can get into if we want uh, later. Problems of accuracy, facial recognition technology is notoriously flawed on people with darker skin. Well, it has to work for everybody if we're gonna roll it out in London or Paris. It can't just work for white people and particularly white men on whom it performs the best. So that's great for them, but it's not great for everyone else. And they don't make up the majority of the city so we can't really use a technology that only works for them. But even if we solve that problem, if we solve accuracy, we still have to deal with the social contract. So that deals with our notion of what it means to be free, what it means to have rights, what it means to have a relationship with the police or the state, which if you're living with a benevolent government is fine, but you might find yourself in a place where you don't trust the police or you don't trust the government. And then do you want them to have that kind of technology to use on you? And the thing I would also highlight with facial recognition is you won't necessarily know if it's being used on you. It's not even a question of asking for your consent. You won't even know it, but they will. Cybersecurity, <laughs> this is a really big one that I think hasn't gotten enough attention. So if we network up our cities, so they are totally connected and gathering loads of data and it's amazing and the nerds can go and crunch it, that's great. But it also makes your city a big target. So you could accidentally leak data, which happens all the time, or people could hack you. Um, they can attack you in all sorts of ways. They could, as just happened here in London at Hackney City Council, just down the road from me, hackers got in and have held the entire city government's data sets for ransom. And it has completely slowed down the functioning of, of civic life. And you know, do you wanna pay them or not? This happened again in Atlanta, Georgia in the United States, very expensive very irritating to have to solve, pretty embarrassing, um, although it can happen to anyone. So what do we do? So we need to think about that. And there's also a national security risk, which is given the incredible cybersecurity talent that is out there on this planet, you could in theory shut down aspects, if not the entire city without firing a shot, right? So we have to just think about that. Do we really want everything interconnected or do you want to be able to fail safely if that happens? and you should probably assume it's going to happen, so how? And then the last point here on risks is um, am amplifying existing problems. So I think this is quite important because we have to be very honest about some uncomfortable things in life, uh, which is that we have class systems and massive inequality. And some of that is happening along gender lines. Some of that's happening along racial lines, um, language access lines, immigration lines, all of it. And what that means is sometimes the very people who are doing the work to make our cities function are the very people who would be on the receiving end of smart technology, which is often built for middle-class and upper-class people who can afford iPhones and laptops and have Wi-Fi and who might be reporting on whether or not their street sweeper is doing a good job. But it's not going back the other way. It's one-way traffic. So we just want to think about impact. Um, not everybody's got access to Wi-Fi as we're seeing right now in this pandemic. So, you know, what does that mean? Who, who benefits from a smart city and who doesn't? And then who's actually hurt by it? So that's about being equitable. So we've sketched out our big, um, our big picture. We're going to go through a pretty quick tour, so sort of keeping an eye on time, of the technology itself. So get ready. <laughs> this is Dame Cressida Dick, who is the Commissioner of London's Metropolitan Police, an August body here in my city. 
And she warned in September of 2019 that Britain risks sleepwalking into a ghastly Orwellian omniscient police state, which are pretty strong words coming from a cop, <laughs> unless we address the ethical dilemmas posed by new tech such as facial recognition and artificial intelligence. So I really loved that she acknowledged these problems head on and acknowledged that they pose ethical dilemmas. She's acknowledging the complexity of these technologies and saying we need to address it. Um, and you can't, you can't talk about technology in Britain without mentioning George Orwell. So I love that she gets that reference in as well. <laughs> Big Brother is indeed watching us. So that might be a little bit scary for those of us who are like, what is artificial intelligence? So for you, I have created this slide, which I hope will make it easy. And again, you can have this PowerPoint deck if it's helpful to you, otherwise ignore it. But I thought it would be useful given that most of the media likes to paint artificial intelligence as robots that are coming to kill us or take our jobs um, and do a bit of real talk. So you can see down the bottom, there's like a timeline. We're obviously at 2021, so you know where we are. We are in the category called weak, narrow AI. And that's going to include things like sensors and robots, machine learning, um, reasoning, some problem solving and planning, so good for things like traffic. Um, <laughs> we're also dealing with something called machine learning. That's a subset of AI. And indeed, most of AI that we are using today is machine learning. And don't overthink it. Just machine learning is like, very powerful uses of statistics, okay? <laughs> Deep learning is like machine learning on steroids. So it just shows you it's really, really powerful, but still quite niche. We do not yet need to worry, and we may never need to worry about what you see on the right-hand side of your screen, which is the strong general AI, and that's the sort of self-aware, conscious, intelligent machines that are like humans or even more so, that's the singularity, super intelligence, it's all very exciting if that's your gem. But if it's not, just stick with reality. We're here in 2021, we're largely using, using machine learning and that's largely statistics on steroids. So I can bust through some of the um, <laughs> AI hype with this slide, I hope. And confidence booster, don't overthink it. You are using AI already, I guarantee you are. If you go online and you use a search engine, if you're on social media, you use Amazon or Spotify for your shopping or music. If you watch television on Netflix or films, if you've ever had an X-ray or a mammogram, that's using AI. If you've ever used a translation tool, I use them all the time, that's AI. Um, connected devices, if you have an Amazon Echo in your home, you are using AI, so it's fine. You're good. <laughs> just for those of you who are like, yes, but I don't get it. Just think of it like the sausage making. So I'm, I'm reducing this to its absolute bare bones, but it's because I just don't want us to get hung up on it. So data in. <laughs> That's all the data that I've listed down on the left-hand side. So it's your biometrics, race, sex, religion, all of it. Key point in red. It's not just about you. It's about everyone in your network. So your data is by definition, including other people's data, which is why it's really not good to go, I have nothing to hide, nothing to fear, because yes, you do. And so do the people you love. Everyone does. <laughs> it's just part of being human. So, um, so, you know, just be aware of that. It all goes into a model, which crunches it and does whatever it's being asked to do by data scientists. And then out comes an outcome. That is your sausage. <laughs> so, don't overthink it. Um, for those of you who are who are experts in this, I apologize for reducing it, but I also think it's just important to do some real talk. And I've highlighted here in blue a wonderful book by Dr. Kathy O'Neill called Weapons of Math Destruction, which is superb. She's a mathematician. It's a slim little volume. It's written in beautiful, elegant, succinct prose. And she just comes up with some great questions to help you test if that model is actually working. Um, I really recommend reading her book. It's fantastic. AI is wonderful, but be careful. This is not a technology to just roll out because it sounds amazing or it's gonna save you money. This is the sort of thing that can lead you to serious lawsuits um, if you are a government or a company. So be careful. And I've listed these here. This is from an NGO, a non-governmental non organization called Privacy International. And it just gives some examples of the risks that can happen when you use AI. 
and I've got some questions in here on each one of these. I'm not going to spend time on them here. I just want you to know that this slide is in the deck in case you want it for close reading later. But it's there. And it's really just to put it there for you to go, I want you to think about the input, the model, the output. This is the next level of how to do that. That is all. Biometrics, before we get into facial recognition technology, which is the biometric that most of us know, love, slash hate, um, biometrics are all about your body. All of your body can be turned into data, which is either wonderful or terrifying. <laughs> so I put this in with first generation and second generation to talk about legislation. So most of the time in most countries and definitely here in the UK, so I'm gonna give a very UK analysis here if I may. It may be different in France, and I apologize that I haven't focused on France for this, but I'm going to give you the UK version at least. DNA and fingerprints, when used by police, are covered pretty well in legislation. Less so for private companies, which should raise concern. <laughs> Second generation biometrics, so that's your face, your feelings, your emotions. Um, your footprints, so how you walk, your eyes, your voice, your finger geometry, like literally how your hands are spaced apart, your fingers, the digits, those ratios, they can all be turned into math. Um, your heartbeat, <laughs> your vein print, right? So actual inside your body can be scanned. And then in theory, even your behaviors, like how you type, how you move your mouse when you're online. All of that can be turned into data. Most of it is not regulated. Some of it is highly suspect as science and I put emotions in there specifically. So we're almost going back to the 19th century and these people who think that they're cutting edge might wanna read their history again. It's, um, it's a bit dubious, but it's just worth thinking about so that when you're hearing about facial recognition, understand that that is the, the thin edge of the wedge. That's just the beginning of where this, where this technology can go, which is why we want to think about regulating it. So what does this have to do with smart cities, you say? Don't worry, I'm with you. So <laughs> it might be on your phone. It might be on your social media because you're putting pictures of yourself on there and you're also showing your behaviors. You might put a, a microchip into your hand, into your arm, uh, which is quite extreme, but people are doing it. Maybe that is extreme for you. So you, instead of implanting it in your hand, put it on your wrist in the form of a Fitbit or a Garmin to do your athletic travels and um, monitoring. But you can also think about your home. The minute you make your home into a smart home, that starts creating a data set about you and your family and how you use your home. Your car is already, new cars are already collecting all sorts of data from whether or not you're tired, uh, angry or stressed, how much you weigh in your car seat. All of that's being uh, measured. Lots of biometric data is being gathered in schools on children with very little regulation, loads at work, particularly with those of us working at home now, there's all sorts of software that our employers can install, taking our pictures and seeing what we're doing online. Also, they're just hearing what's happening in our homes now because of the microphones, potentially, if they're using that software. So worth asking, check with your union. <laughs> City, down at the bottom, and then country. So some cities are gonna be very advanced on smart tech and others less so. So it just depends on where you're living, how much of this is going to be applying to you. Alarm bells from the private sector of all places, unexpected, but we have to deal with the facts and here they are. Last year, January, 2020, Sundar Pichai, who is the CEO of Alphabet, the parent company of Google, said he was in favor of a moratorium on facial recognition technology. He thinks it's too risky. Would, would love for lawmakers to do something about it. In June, we saw IBM, Amazon, and Microsoft follow suit. Now, caveat to this is that Amazon said it would stop selling its facial recognition to the police for one year. That's a little bit dubious because of what they're doing with Amazon ring doorbells and also what they're doing on their delivery vans so that everything is all being kitted up and that footage can be requisitioned by the police. So no need to sell this technology to the police if you can just get citizens to use it on their doorbells for you and then hand it over or you put it in your delivery vans, which because of Amazon's dominance are all over our cities photographing, not just the driver and what's happening in the van, but on the sides of the van. And that's fairly new, that announcement. 
And then just yesterday, to show you how up to date this PowerPoint is, Clearview AI is an American company that has scraped the internet of more than 3 billion photos that we were all posting of ourselves online in good faith, thinking that we were having fun. But instead, someone has taken all of them and turned them into this lovely facial recognition tool that is now used by over 2,400 US law enforcement agencies. It was being used in Canada and was found yesterday to be illegal and to constitute mass surveillance. So authorities in Australia and the United Kingdom are also pursuing their own inquiries into this technology, so stay tuned. I didn't have a chance to check if it's being used in France, so I would love to hear from you if you know the answer to that. Last but not least, I'm just keeping an eye on time, I think we're good. Who is building your smart city technology? So I've already named Alphabet, Google, IBM, Amazon, Clearview AI. Those are some of your American contenders, and I just want to make sure that I highlight them because I'm about to go big on another country here in just a moment, so get ready. This matters. <laughs> Who is building your smart city technology? You may recognize the two uh, leaders of the two superpowers of the 21st century. We've got Xi Jinping, Premier of China, and President Joe Biden of the United States, just recently inaugurated. The United States and China are in the middle of a tech cold war at the moment, which means that all the rest of us get to just watch and be dominated by them, or not, depending on whether or not we decide to take action. Although that's tricky, that's very tricky. So China has gone quite big on smart city technology, and we're gonna get into that here, but both countries, so I really want to be um, as balanced as I can on this, both an authoritarian country and a liberal democracy are very active and powerful and strong when it comes to building things like facial recognition, predictive policing, artificial intelligence. Um, we need to think about that because people like to say that technology is neutral and it depends really just on how it's being used and by whom. We need to think about that because of what I'm going to be discussing going forward. And you can ask yourselves whether or not you think China or the United States are producing neutral tech. So I would like to hear your views on that rather than share mine. But the implications for this are things like data protection, cybersecurity. Again, we've seen some quite big hacking stories recently. Solar winds in the United States is the big one, uh, but there are many more. Security of supply is going to be the one that I'm going to focus on here. But we have to acknowledge, we must mention, we cannot have this, this discussion without mentioning the human rights and indeed crimes against humanity that are being perpetuated in Western China right now. So I have links in this PowerPoint. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but there's an entire system of internment camps, persecution, tortures, and rapes that are happening in Western China. And that is being supported by this technology. Some of that technology is built by China. Some of it was built by the United States. So, we can just realize that all of a sudden this gets quite dark quite quickly. China has gone big on emerging technologies. And I just wanted to put this in here because we want to remember and always keep in mind the positives of smart city technology. China makes 70% of the world's solar photovoltaic panels. So that's really important if we're looking to go green. Um, it makes half of all electric vehicles, a third of the world's wind power. It's the biggest battery provider. So, you know, making an electric vehicle without involving China is nearly impossible. Good luck with that. Uh, they're very strong, very gifted um, and successful on artificial intelligence, facial recognition technology. They make some of the leading tech on that. And the companies I'm listing here are Huawei and Hikvision. There are many more. 5G has been a story long dominated by Huawei. Huawei has been the world leading company in producing 5G. The other two um, are, you know, struggling to catch up. And that was a big story of the past year and has seen Huawei curtailed, I think, a bit, you could say, by the United States with some of its political muscle flexing, but they can't enjoy that advantage forever. But the big one that I'm going to focus on here, just because I think it's so weird and counterintuitive for most of us, uh, when we look at our phone or our laptop, do we think about raw minerals? Um, the minerals that are needed to produce clean energy, many of them are mainly found in China at the moment. So lots of them exist in different parts of the world, but China has taken the lead on extracting them from 
the earth. So cobalt, something called rare earths minerals, there are 17 of those. Polysilicon, which is used in solar panels. These are used to make everything from our smartphones to our laptops, our, our iPads, wind turbines, they're used in the aerospace industry. So key stuff, all depends on this. I'm just turning up my timer for myself. Um, so the red flag here, because we are in Europe, I hope being in the United Kingdom, I can still say that we're in Europe. Apologies for Brexit. <laughs> the big red flag is that the EU is over-reliant on China for these key minerals, and that jeopardizes the EU's goal of becoming climate neutral by 2050. So the EU knows this. I'm not telling you anything out of school. All of my research here is open source, but I just wanted to put it forward for us to think about in the discussion. This matters. So we're thinking about rocks and dirt, but this actually matters for foreign policy. Smart city projects is a global power strategy. So China has something called the Belt and Road Initiative, which is a big infrastructure project that China is doing around the world. Again, largely, well, you can see on the map, uh, which I've taken from the Financial Times, but quite interesting here, there's a distinction that they make, smart city equipment versus safe city equipment. And notice how safe is basically used as a substitute for surveil. Well, smart can also be used as a substitute for surveillance, but in theory can go for the more um, positive sides of smart cities like efficiency and um, better, better use of resources. So that map there shows you what is going on and really interesting as a strategy. So what is Europe's response to that? Both as receivers of this technology, but also as potential builders of it. Obviously the United States will be having its view um, and other countries as well. Supply chains, <laughs> here's your big picture. Sorry that I'm going on about um, rocks. That was not my intention when I came up with this presentation, but I just thought this was so cool and just kind of worth thinking about again. So your big picture is that Europe is totally over-reliant on China for this. That jeopardizes the climate neutral goals for 2050, should China, for instance, choose to not export these materials to us. Um, and the pandemic, I think the reason that I was thinking about this so um, acutely is I feel the pandemic for all of us has really made us think about supply chains. So when we all needed masks, we didn't have enough. We were needing to get them from China. Um, ventilators, right? Food. Here in Britain, you know, we had a pretty scary week just before New Year's where we started to see food shortages because we hadn't solved Brexit. Um, the UK government was having negotiations, final negotiations on Brexit. And it suddenly made everybody very aware of how much we rely on imports for our food. So just thinking about supply chains, which is like the veins and arteries of the globe, suddenly becomes quite crucial. We need to identify other sources for these rare earths. We also need to think about how to build the batteries, for instance, that we need more efficiently, et cetera. So big challenge for the engineers if they're watching, but also the policymakers who support them. And I'm going to end us there and hope to God that Alexa jumps in and rescues me. Um, but I've just put this here at the end. If you're like me, you will come up with your best questions in about three days time and think that's too late. It is not. Please feel free to reach out to me. I'm on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, you can get in touch, I'm sure, via this, this organization. And you're very welcome to have the PowerPoint if it is useful and to ignore it if it is not. So thank you so much for your patience. Well, thank you for that. Um really wonderful, clear walk through smart cities um, and the technology that goes in into them. Um, so sadly, we are we are at time. Um, I think we can stay two minutes, uh, maybe to to answer one or two questions. But uh, as Steph just very generously offered, if you think of questions now, please put them in the Q&A and you're also welcome to email us, um, contact us through the website and we can figure out some kind of uh, follow-up and, um, and tackle some of these questions because this uh, theme of smart cities is, is very big and complex and very important. Um, so we do have some, some really interesting questions that have come in. So I want to get to those, um, but I also selfishly have my own questions that, that I <laughs> am really curious about. So 
I think that this is that we've had this very interesting day where we've been looking at um, all the, the question of smart cities and green cities from many, many angles, um, historical, ecological, um, and we've had some very rich discussions. So coming to this, you know, having sort of been in this all day. I'm really thinking about what are we, what kinds of values or ideologies are we embedding, you know, into the very structures of our cities? And which is to say that embedding ideologies, embedding values in cities is not new. We know that that was, you know, the project of, of the Haussmannian or reconfiguration of Paris. So it's not that it's new, and but it's perhaps newly powerful in that these technologies, for example, like biometric technology, once that's captured about you, that's captured about you. You can't change your face. You can't change your gait. So there is something new that perhaps is also layered on older forms. So I'm just curious to hear a bit of your reflection on, on that. Yes. Oh, gosh. So there's, there's a debate, I think, about whether technology is neutral. And a lot of technologists like to say that it is because they're like, I think it was Gary Kasparov, the chess grandmaster, who has lots of views on AI, was saying things like ethical AI is like ethical electricity. Like this just doesn't make any sense. So I think that, that quote, that view, you know, it's just math and physics, um, captures one way of looking at technology. And then there's a very different point of view um, I'm probably more in line with, which is technology is embedded with values from the moment a person has an idea because it's coming out of that person's brain to the, you know, the whole process by which they transform the idea into reality. So all of that is going to have values. There's also the fact that the technology, when it's put onto the population, I think um, Sheila Jasanoff at Harvard said, the same technology has a different impact in Kansas City than in Kabul. And we see that with something like a Facebook, which you know is used around the world but with very different problems as a result. So it can be used to facilitate genocide or to sell a lamp, right? And it's the same tech. So yes, I think that there's a lot of values that are being embedded in technology and that's, that's the challenge, but possibly the opportunity I also think there's something interesting to think about. Um, I think about like AI for good and how um, they might be this idea that, okay, we're gonna use facial recognition technology to find missing children. And who can disagree with that? Like that sounds like a very worthy thing to do. And yet that would form a very tiny, tiny percentage of the ways in which facial recognition technology is used. So I think there's also something to think about in terms of, um, like I am, because I do think that there is, there feels like this potential, like, oh, we could use uh, machine learning to use electricity in much more efficient ways. And it, it, there feels like this green potential, but I'm wondering, does that green potential like come with other things that we need to be thinking about? Yeah. So I'm curious if, if we could tie, is there, or maybe we're still learning about this, but to think about the more direct connection between green technologies and, and human rights. Yeah, so there's the whole thing of like, I have a smart meter now in my flat um, for things like water and electricity. And the way that that's often marketed to people, although in, in this country it was like, you can do it voluntarily now, or we will make you do it in a year. So I was like, hmm, oh, what a wonderful choice. I'll choose now just because I wanted to see and to learn from it. And what was interesting is it shows you your water usage and gives you sort of options and ideas for how to make that more efficient. So you pay less, right? So like, that's really interesting. But at the same time, all of that's of course going back to our supplier, the utility supplier, who would know if I was home or not or what my patterns are. If there's more people living here than I say there are, which is like a tax issue, right? So <laughs> there's... Like even on something as little and petty as like an individual person in her flat, what does that mean for her rights and privacy? Uh, which sounds like what on earth could that have to do with human rights? But it starts to become ideas of like how you would monitor entire communities. Um, 
you know, I don't think most of us will hopefully ever be on the end of police or intelligence surveillance, but we might be in a neighborhood whose data is being used in a way that informs policy that then hurts us or benefits us, depending on our postcode. Right, so I think that's, I think you're right. The opportunity is there. The question is how do we build in you know, privacy by design as much as possible and then make it transparent to the, to the user, to the citizen in this case, to the customer. And then transparency is not enough. If I'm not happy with what I'm being given, like I can have all the information I want, but if I have no power to do anything with it, that's about you know, accountability and enforceability. So hooray that you've given me a transparency report, but if I can't change what I think you're doing that's wrong, so of little use. So I think, yeah, I think we're still at the beginning. Yeah, it seems to me that these are not um, purely questions for the future or purely theoretical questions because of the case that you talked about in Canada that had to do with scraping people's photos from places like Flickr. And um, so we can, we know that we already, as, that we are maybe being pulled into data sets to develop technologies that then will be used in ways that um, we may not agree with or that we, but at any rate, whether we agree with them or not, we don't have very much control over the way that they are being developed. So I think that seems to me that like an interesting feature so that it's even at the, at the level of scraping the data that we begin to um, run into these, these problems before even the technology is fully developed necessarily. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, um, I feel sad to, to bring this to a close because obviously this is um, such a rich topic um, but I would encourage people to please do send us some questions and we can do some kind of follow-up yeah. Um, you can always answer them and put them out as like a Q and A blog post or something. So yeah, please. that would be great. That would be <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, exactly. Um, thank you, Stephanie. What like a really um, <laughs> I, it was like it's such an energizing way to to end the day. But then also, yeah, it gives us a lot to think about and um, uh, maybe a bit to worry about. So thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Happy to make you worried anytime. <laughs> Merci beaucoup à, à tous les Français qui nous écoutent et les Françaises. <laughs> Thank you to everyone uh, for joining for joining us. Um, it's thank you for spending the day with us on Zoom, which I know that uh, we are all tired of Zoom. We were together in person last year for this symposium, and I hope we will be together in person again next year. But this has been um, such a thought provoking and wonderful day. So also thank you to all of our speakers um, for sharing their insights with us. Thank you to Meredith. Um, thank you to our team who's put in a lot of energy and effort today working behind the scenes to make everything run very smoothly. And thank you again to the British Embassy in France for their financial support of this symposium. This has been a really wonderful day. Um, and Yes, I'd like to um, put up our thank you slide if we can to acknowledge everybody. So oh, maybe you can, yeah, there we well, go. Oh, well, we go. <laughs> while we're putting that up, I just want to say again that um, we have collected most of the Q&A questions from all of the keynotes and, and sessions. So we will, in addition to, be, to putting um, recordings of the entire symposium on our website, we will do something with the questions especially the unanswered ones, and there will be some other follow-ups. So please check the website and we will try to stay in touch with everyone who has registered to let you know the kind of follow-ups that we're doing. So thank you again to everyone. Yes, uh, please follow us on social media and keep in touch because we have other projects um, in the works. And yeah, so let's keep the conversation going.